Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again everyone and welcome to Lakeland Currents. We live in an absolutely amazing period of time. If you think about it, the number one taxi company in the world does not own a taxi, Uber. The number one uh, hoteler in the world doesn't own a single hotel room, uh, Airbnb. They don't have one single room that they own. And yet when we deal with the issue we're talking about tonight, mental health, in many ways we still live in the Stone Age. And so our guests this evening are here to talk about mental health issues, specifically in maybe Crow Wing County, but this is something that can carry across a very, very wide range. I'm happy to introduce Adam Reese, a guitar exceptional player. <laughs> He's the president of Essentia Health Central, which is the central region of, central, of uh, Essentia Health. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back in a minute and talk about that. And Dr. Peter Henry, who is the chief medical officer for this Essentia Health Central, but also for the broader uh, Essentia Health, as I understand. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the program, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. And maybe we could just give a little background about what Essentia Health is. You know, growing up in Brainerd, I remember this used to be the St. Joseph Hospital, and now it's a member of a, a much broader organization. Maybe sure. you could, one of you could talk about that. Address that. <clears throat> sure. So, so uh, <clears throat> the headquarters for Essentia, it, it's in Duluth, and, uh, and that was a, a, a merger of uh, St. Mary's Hospital and the Duluth Clinic, and and that continued to grow. They're, they're actually, their presence not only is completely surrounds the sort of that upper western, I'm sorry, upper eastern part of the state, but actually goes into uh, western Wisconsin as well. And then, and then as you sort of sweep across, you in the this, this central area, you know, St. Joe's Hospital, we have uh, small clinics um, as, as far south as Piers, for instance, as far east as Emily, as far north as uh, Hackensack, and, and west uh, in Pillager as well, and then there are some others in between. And then, and then you just keep marching across, and then, and then uh, our next sort of hub is in the Fargo area. So, uh, and, and they have a, a, a series of, of clinics and smaller hospitals as well surrounding them. So it's, it's a large area, uh, thousands of employees. Um, what makes Essentia unique is that it, it is primarily a rural delivery system. Most of these large uh, integrated systems are metropolitan based. And uh, for those of us who are passionate about rural health, uh, we've really enjoyed the Essentia system. I would just add that we have uh, I think roughly 15 hospitals and uh, around 64 clinics in our organization. So we do have a very large oh. geographic area that we uh, uh, provide care to people. And, and roughly how many employees would you say are involved? Any idea? Um, it's around 13,000, between 13, 13 000. and 14,000. Wow, that's impressive. Well, I was at the meeting when uh, your hospital mm -hmm gave the presentation on mental health in Crow Wing County. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I was floored by the information presented there. Mm. And in a, in a way, I probably shouldn't have been because I grew up in Brainerd. I remember when we had a large state hospital here right. where we dealt with the severe cases of mental illness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I've been in places like Washington, D.C., where I see people living in cardboard boxes. And we had this era we went through nationally where we started closing these hospitals mm. and putting mental, um, mentally ill people, and again, I'm talking probably more of the se severe cases, sure. out in the streets, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, we really have done that, literally. And so when you came and said that one in four Crow Wing County f uh, folks were affected by mental mm -hmm. health issues, uh, that was amazing to me. So maybe you could start with that. Yeah, so, so we do uh, regularly surveys um, and, and they're part of our community health needs assessment. And, and the survey you're referencing uh, was quite extensive. We partnered with Crow Wing County uh, Public Health and uh, we have about 62,500 people in Crow Wing County and I can't remember the exact sample size but it was significant. I it was in the six, seven hundred people range and 
And it was, again, uh, simply they were disclosing, they were answering what kind of issues and concerns they have. And, and they disclosed that, uh, that again, this, this one in four number is struggling with some kind of, of mental health condition. Now, th that can be severe. It could be sort of psychosis at one end. It could be uh, technically more uh, less severe, more minor. However, for that individual, for instance, if it's acute anxiety, that can have a profound impact on one's work situation or at the home life as, as well and so and everything in between we know there's very high prevalence of depression in Crow Wing County. What's interesting is that there's been state surveys and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure the state average is about one in five uh, so this one in four, one in five, you can see we're not that much different. That's still very significant to it, me. It, it's different, and what's <laughs> it's significant, as you point out, Ray, but what, what I find fascinating is that we never talk about it. You know, it's interesting. It's self-reported in our survey that we did with, within the Crowing County and the surrounding uh, service area that we, that we have that the self-report at about a one in four instance, but even go back to when I was in medical school a number of years ago uh, when I was in training it, it was clearly recognized at that time about 30 percent of the people that come into a family physician or a primary care office with a complaint whether it be a somatic or physical complaint are really there as a direct result of a mental health condition so wow. one out of three even so this is not an unrecognized problem within the medical community but I think uh, the public and the knowledge as to how this affects so many people within our society. And anxiety is probably one of the, the key ones, especially in our younger population as well. I know the last couple of years there's been a lot of debate at the legislative level with the governor, uh, specifically Moose Lake and some of those uh, institutions. And again, we're not always just talking severe cases here. We could be talking, like you said, anxiety and other mm -hmm. things. But there's been a reluctance, I think, from the national level and from the state level to fix this. It seems like we're just shoving these folks into your kinds of system, a healthcare system that isn't really designed to handle the number. I, I know, Adam, you talked about having people in, um, I think, in your emergency rooms mm -hmm. staying there for extended periods of time. Could you just talk a little bit about the impact? I, that has or I, can back to, I can briefly talk about the emergency <laughs> department. Pete's actually I an emergency room physician. In, okay. <laughs> in that area. Um, you know, I've been in here in the Brainerd Lakes area going on 19 years and at St. Joseph's Medical Center. And I've worked in the emergency department uh, throughout that time. And I will tell you, up until roughly two years ago, we almost never had anybody who had to be boarded in our emergency department. We had facilities where we could place them on a relatively short time frame to get them the ongoing well, care. What kind of need. facilities would that be usually? Well, you know, in the past, when I first got here, we had the state facilities. We had the Brainerd facility, okay. which was very uh, close. So those facilities were readily available. There was room uh, and patient beds available that we could transfer them. As the number of beds for mental health inpatient care has declined dramatically over the last 10 to mm. 12 years, that ability to move people from our emergency department and acute care settings into longer term where they can get all the services that are necessary to treat their mental health issues has dramatically decreased. And up until two years ago, uh, I was a director of the emergency department before t assuming my position as the chief medical officer. Uh, we, we really never housed anybody in our emergency department and now it is essentially, there's very few days that we don't have somebody that's on, uh, who's being boarded in our emergency department and we're attempting to provide the care that they need, but it's not the right place to do that. And, and that's not yeah. isolated to our facility here. This is across all of our essential facilities. Uh, and it's also a, a, not just a rural area. This is a huge issue within the metropolitan area and emergency departments there as well. Um, many emergency departments, for example, our emergency department in Duluth at St. Mary's has modified its structure so it can house people so they have a separate piece of their emergency department that is dedicated to housing mental health patients that can't be placed in the appropriate long-term care facility. 24 bed emergency department of which I believe four to six is dedicated directly to the care of mental, he mental health issue patients and at one time we have this is a level two trauma so it's the major regional trauma center we had uh, 10 
beds occupied by mental health patients, and so then you were down to 14 beds that were allowed to treat the other What you're supposed conditions. to be doing. Correct. So, so maybe just, you know, in defense of legislators of the past, we probably were at one time overbedded in psychiatric uh, facilities. And, and w with the advent of these antipsychotic medication and others, and Pete could comment more on that, the treatments improved drastically and we didn't quite need what we had in the past. And so there probably at one point were some appropriate reductions. The challenge though, Ray, is that the reductions just continued year after year, decade after decade. And we're now in a situation where Minnesota, which many believe is probably the best health care in the country, uh, or one of the best, when it comes to mental health services, we have less uh, locked inpatient beds than any other state in the whole country, which is just shocking. And so the crisis that, that um, Dr. Henry's talking about um, is, is really profound and, it, and a quick fix isn't going to work. And so, you know, I appreciate the steps that the bipartisan legislature made and, uh, and, and there will be a, a, a modest increase, for instance, to the, for these community behavioral health centers. And we have one actually in Baxter. Right. Um, they were designed for 16 beds. Uh, they've been, uh, they were sort of defunded down to about 10 beds. And, and, and hopefully they'll be able to get back up to 16 beds. But, but when you're talking about six, uh, an extra six beds here, an extra six beds there, it, it, it's a step in the right direction, but it's still a drop in the bucket. The level of this crisis is huge. And, um, and it's impacting people in different ways. But just to share with you, uh, Pete's talking about the emergency department. Uh, we have these patients in our ICU as well occasionally, but, but a, a real travesty is that many of these individuals end up in the prison system, in our jails, and, uh, and they can't get the care they need, uh, uh, and, and, and had perhaps they had better treatment, we could have kept them out of that system. And the cost, actually, to care for these patients in the emergency department or in our jails is far higher than actually in an inpatient setting like at Anoka or St. Peter. And so, so we're in this odd situation where we don't have the right resources. We're using other resources that really weren't designed for these patients. And in addition, we're costing the state more money than, than it really needs to, uh, to, uh, to, to use for this population that's now being uh, you know, underserved, if you will. So uh, it's, it's certainly near and dear to our heart and our colleagues' hearts. We, we care about these people, and we, we desperately want to do a better job to serve them. I can <clears throat> only imagine that a medical doctor is not really trained to deal with many of these issues you're dealing with, but you don't have a staff of psychologists that are a whole, I know you had, I think it was a psychologist or a psych psychiatrist, psychiatrist yeah, that was at the presentation I was at, yeah. he was talking about his load, right. and it's just in incredible. So I can imagine that medical doctors having to deal with these issues when that's not really what their background is is also very, very frustrating, isn't it? I th well, I think that most physicians who are staffing emergency departments are trained to deal with the acute psychosis and psychotic okay. episodes that require treatment in the emergency department. And most of these patients, as Ad Adam alluded to, many of them have additional medical conditions that need to be treated. So they end up our, in our intensive care unit. But usually that can be stabilized within a day or two. And beyond that, then they require their ongoing mental health care. And that's where the, the issue is, because uh, there's a wide spectrum as to uh, general anxiety, mild depression, severe depression, depression with suicide ideation, and then you get into the, all the psychotic issues, and then the, the violently psychotic issues. Mm -hmm. And so protecting the communities. Um, for years, we had facilities where people who required more intensive treatment, who were really at risk of harming themselves or others, could be housed and treated. And as Adam uh, stated, the, the number of beds for that has gone down dramatically, partly related to the fact that we have much better medications that can treat these conditions. There still is, however, a small subset of these patients that really can't be treated 
in a community-based behavioral setting, uh, a, a group home or a, a assisted living facility or something along that line. They really require intensive treatment in a locked facility and they are at risk of harming themselves, other patients, and also staff. And that's where really the, the major crisis, I believe, is, in my opinion, is coming, is that we don't have places to put those sure. people. So they now stay <clears throat> in our jails because they are so violent. When they're in our jails, they don't get ongoing treatment. They don't get their medications that they need to. They don't get all the behavioral and psychotherapy that's available in a, in a, in a assigned unit for that. And the same thing in our emergency department. We do what we can on our borders because we have them seen daily by mental health professionals. But the other many modalities that go into mental health treatment can't be administered in our emergency departments. They really need to be in these specialized facilities for that. And you know, we, for years, have a system that we have different levels of care provided in different areas. So uh, we, we are not a tertiary or, or what's called a quaternary facility like some of the large metropolitan areas or the Duluth facility in St. Mary's. Uh, we have capacity to treat fairly sick patients, but there is a limit to the amount that we can treat. And the same thing applies to mental health. We can apply and treat majority of mental health conditions here in our own mental health unit, but certain subset that are very violent, that are at risk to themselves, to the community, and to their family members, and to staff, need to be housed in a, in a facility that is designed for that. And we've really limited, or most of those beds are not available. The NOCA Treatment Center is one of them, which currently is and does, does not have the capacity to take on these patients. So they sit wow. in our emergency departments. So I think crisis is an appropriate term. It is a crisis. Absolutely. And, and, and we get into these odd situations. So we have the GRACE unit, that's our inpatient psychiatric facility, which for the most part was designed for voluntary admissions. And, and now we're seeing more involuntary patients and some of these violent individuals. Those individuals, uh, uh, historically, and we still try to do this, try to, try to transfer them uh, to, for instance, Anoka. But with the lack of beds, we're not able to do that. And so these individuals can spend, I think, what, upwards of 40 days? Upwards of 40. On, on average, they're in our uh, facility for 30 days. And you're maybe even in the ER? In the ER, the length, the length of stay that we've had here in our, in our, at St. Joseph's is the maximum, I believe, was 11 or 12 days. Well, that's still a lot. That's a long it? time, uh, but in our Duluth facility, we've had someone there almost a year. Wow. And housed in our emergency. And that's not at all what that was designed for? Not no, at all. No, no. no. So, so what ends up happening, Ray, is that um, these individuals are taking up this space that also could have been used for many uh, local and regional patients. And so what they're finding is they're then forced to be transferred to a facility in Duluth, the Twin Cities, maybe Rochester, you know, um, uh, some other part of the state. And they're separated from their family and their loved ones. And, in, and, and, and because of the acute bed shortage, we find ourselves accepting patients from those same locations. So, so mm -hmm. a person from a southeastern Minnesota finds themselves up here, and the person from up here is down in southeastern Minnesota. Oh. And, and, and so it really is, a, it, it, it's, we're just not serving people as well as they deserve to be served. But that's, that's kind of the reality that we're in. So I, I was reading that <clears throat> in the future, the fastest growing disease in the world is going to be depression. Mm -hmm. So that would suggest that these issues are going to expand. They're not going to go away. What, what would your recommendations be to people who can make the decisions to help solve the problem? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think that there's a huge spectrum of mental health. So depression most mild depression, mild depression can be adequately treated in the home setting. I mean, a person comes in, sees their mental health provider, their primary care physician, gets the appropriate medication, gets ongoing counseling. Um, a lot of this on the front end, if we do a good job of treating depression, anxiety, and even uh, some of the more significant psychiatric illnesses on the front end, we can prevent the more serious illness. But there is a limit to that. There are still going to be a number of patients that are severely psychotic that cannot be housed. So the answer is, is that 
it's going to cost money. And, and I think the, my message to the, the legislators is that this is a crisis. It is a not an isolated issue related to Brainerd or our surrounding area. This is a statewide and national issue. Mm -hmm. And that at some point in time, we need to commit as a community to putting dollars into place to treat this. Um, it, it, we're not going to get smaller. Our younger generation, the millennials, they've shown that anxiety is probably the number one mental health condition that they'll be facing in the future and, and currently. And uh, we need to start addressing that on the front end. Uh, even if you just look at the dementia and the Alzheimer's issue with the baby boomers, uh, that's a crisis waiting to happen as well. And many of these people with mental health conditions such as Alzheimer's end up in our facilities as well because they don't have adequate treatment facilities to put, get placed in them. And that, Adam, you mentioned earlier that treating them the, on the back end is actually more expensive than it would be to have that treatment right up front. Right, so really, I, I don't think there's one answer. I, I think as Pete is, is sharing with us, uh, we, we definitely need more investment on the back end. No question about it. Um, uh, on the front end, though, it turns out that um, not only can we do a, a better job of, of collaborating primary care doctors, for instance, with uh, behavioral health specialists in the community, therapists, counselors, social workers, um, but, but we as, as a community can take some ownership for this as well. And, and there's been a fair amount of research that, that suggests that in many communities, including ours, mental illness has a lot of stigma. And so we don't talk about it. And not talking about it actually can make things a lot worse because that individual is really struggling mm -hmm. and they're, they're losing perhaps social support mechanisms. And so uh, trying to make it okay uh, to, to talk about these things, being a good friend, being a good family member, that alone is very powerful. Uh, we also have lots of other people in this community that, that want to help, whether it's uh, through our churches, uh, all, all sorts of other organizations. And, and, and so um, we have a broad-based community health uh, approach we call Crowing Energize. It's a movement here that um, that a number of agencies are collaborating on. It's co-chaired by uh, by Essentia Health and, and the Public Health Department of Crowing County. But we're trying to share with uh, businesses and other organizations that we can do simple little things uh, in our everyday life that will make us more resilient and will actually help us combat perhaps um, some more uh, uh, milder forms of depression, help us cope, cope with anxiety and other kinds of uh, significant life challenges that come along. And, and so I really think that, that all of us, if we can work on destigmatizing it, uh, being just good friends, good neighbors, and, uh, and considering some of these very simple tools that are being shared through Crowing Energized. Uh, and, and if I could do a little plug, Crowing Energized is nonprofit. Uh, the, anyone can Google it, and, uh, and materials are on the, on the web. So the point here is that it's going to take a community, isn't it, to Absolutely. solve this problem? Do you see a movement back to, uh, for the more severe cases to uh, more facilities like we used to have? Do you see a movement to, I'm not saying go back and have the full Fergus Falls operation or the Brainerd operation, but there needs to be beds or places for the more severe person. It, and they don't have a place to go now if Anoka is full. Do you see some investment in that kind of operation again? Well, I, uh, my hope is that there will be investment in that operation because I believe treating on the front end and a lot of the things that we talk about that Crowing Energize is promoting will help, but there is a crisis now that's not going to be met by approaching it from that standpoint alone. We, in the next five to ten years, the ability to care for these patients that are severely mentally ill is, is, needs to be met, and that will require some building of facilities. And if you look at whatever cost that is estimated to be, if it's $200 million, if you look at the dollars that are currently being spent in our emergency departments, our ICUs, uh, um, that will be a small amount of investment compared to what we're currently spending in the most expensive care places to treat these patients. And they're not getting 
Um, we at Essentia are doing everything that we can to treat them appropriately in our emergency departments, but you can't treat a severely mentally ill patient in an emergency department the same way you can in a design a facility that's designed to have the full range of mental health services available to them. And the security is also a huge issue. We want to keep, obviously, the patient themselves safe. We want to keep the other patients in our emergency department safe, but we want to keep our staff safe as well. And we're doing whatever we can to make sure that we have designed our facilities, have the appropriate security in our buildings to make sure that happens, as do a lot of other facilities across the state. I would say the average person like myself driving down the road had no idea this problem was as mm -hmm. severe as you're explaining that it is. I think you're doing a great public service by bringing this forward <clears throat> so we can all understand that we have an issue that we need to deal with. Um, I, I, I think that's a wonderful job you're doing. A family that has a member who is having real health issues, is it still the best choice to start with the hospital? I think the best place is to start with their primary care physician. Uh, at the, the fact that Adam and uh, taking away some of the stigma is a key issue. Uh, it's interesting if um, uh, your doctor tells you that you have a, a thyroid condition and that your thyroid gland is not producing enough thyroid hormone and they give you a substance that's going to make your thyroid function better. Nobody has any stigma associated with it. I have hypothyroidism and they say, oh, that's fine, that's medical treatment. If we look at most mental, many of the mental health issues, anxiety, depression, there is a true biochemical basis behind a lot of that along mm -hmm. with the psychosocial pieces that go into that. But when somebody talks about, I'm going to give you an antidepressant that will help arrange the chemicals within your brain to work better, there's a different stigma associated with that as opposed to treating diabetes with insulin and the medications we use thyroid disorders with thyroid supplementation that we use, mm -hmm. and we gotta, we got to remove away, move that away. And I think the best place to start is in the primary care physician's office. And Adam alluded to earlier about bringing mental health together with primary care so that you have social services, psychologists, uh, psychiatrists within the, the primary care clinics. That's really a key thing as well to help coordinate that care because so often what I see if I'm a family physician in my office, as I stated before, about 30% of that is related to an underlying mental health condition. Wow. We're out of time. Thank you for bringing this information to us. It's very, very valuable, and uh, hopefully we can see some new things developing. Uh, we appreciate you bringing <coughs> us here and asking us to uh, Thank talk you very about much, this. Adam, Dr. Pete. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time. <laughs>